All right, we are being recorded. Okay, so now we'll get started. Um, first, we're going to be going through the payroll um, migration from Classic into Redesign. Just kind of some steps that um, we want to make sure um, that you're following before um, you do the redesign um, import. So we'll go ahead and do our first one. Um, the first one, and I'm filing um, on the migration procedures, which is located, and I'll bring that over real quick, is located in our documentation under migration procedures, and it's pre-data, and then we're going to be going through the post-import procedures right after that. So you can also follow along with that because um, I'll probably be trying to go and show kind of screenshots or um, stepping you through the process. So, all right, so I will bring that back over. So the first one we're going to be doing is, um, and also I just, in the beginning, right before um, the redesign technical setup and migration guide, um, also that is right here at the top. So um, you can also um, glance over that, and it just gives you the general advice uh, for t uh, migration testing, um, any historical transactions, um, the average exact extract and import run times, and then also gives you the step-by-step -step guide. And then also if you need to contact us for any assistance, we have that right here. And then also any troubleshooting if you get errors during this. This is a place where you can look and diagnose for hung applications, um, so definitely go over this, and then we have actually some articles that you can go through from Migration Data from Classic, Redesign Technical, and Migration. So we actually have where you can just click on those, and that will take you right to those articles. So just a reminder to that that is all there for you for any assistance. So I'll go back over to our migration, and the first one is, um, the first, what you want to make sure you do is in, uh, in Classic, you want to make sure that your SERS date, which is right here in the USP con screen, is the SERS date here. Make sure that that date is set before you close the month. So this date determines when the current posting period on the import. Um, so when you run SERS month, this data set when you run search month and it's processed and then what that does is clear the search month of data accumulators. So you want to make sure that is done. So saying that you're processing May payroll, you want to make sure that search period closing date is set as April 2020. So that's just an example that you want to make sure that that is all done before um, importing. Um, so the search month um, should be processed after your last pay of the month has been completed. So if you're at it month end, um, make sure they run search month before the importing. Now, if they're going to import during the middle of the month or between the first and second payroll of the month, then they should not run um, the search month because you don't want to close that out when you're in the middle of a pay. So you just want to leave that open. Um, same goes for their search month. If you want to make sure, um, usually SERS month is not as important, but it is because you want to make sure for balancing. Um, they can keep this for, keep a copy of that. So when they're at the end of the month then, make sure they run the SERS month and make that, and they can keep that report and then um, use that for balancing as well. Um, the SERS month will also, will clear your month of date accumulators. So if, when you're at the end of the month, make sure you run the SERS month and the SERS month. Okay. Um, a new one that has just been brought on is um, these are only for districts, for your districts that does not use board desk or board rut to process board pay de um, deductions. So if your districts are not using board desk or board rut, they're going to want to do this step before they import. So because what we're finding out that they're having very high dollar amounts being brought over, um, and we want to make sure these totals are cleared for these employer amounts. So what we suggest is um, 
they will have to go into the dead name record first, and they're going to want to add those dates. So here is an example. So right here in your and the dead name, USB dead dead name. They want to make sure that these are filled in. So make sure that your districts have those filled in first. And those are your 400, 450, and your 694 records. And other paid amounts um, deductions. And then they're going to want to run board this. And then when they do that, um, they can contact you, and you can um, go ahead and rename that to not posted. Okay. Um, so the other option is, they will have to probably use Safari, create a spreadsheet of the board paid amounts for those 400, 450, 694 records or any other paid deductions, and then change those to zero and then use the USP load um, to load those in. So then that way those fields are zero before importing. So that is a new one that we want to really point out um, for only your districts that don't use board red or board disk. So just to highlight that one. Andrea, there is a question in the chat on this one before you move on. Okay. Uh, what do we got? Where's my chat? Do you want me to just read it? Yeah, go ahead. Because I, I, okay. uh, my chat's not coming up for some reason. Sure. Um, so it says, what if they're using board disk for some but not all of the board paid deductions? Do they still need to do that? Um, and does yes. it only apply to the retirement records? Um, it says it is if for any um, employer amount that they want to do that for. So board wet would definitely be just your retirement, but your board debt would be for any employer amount. So this is for um, any other board paid deductions that um, that are not currently they're using board debt for. So these want to make sure that they go in to that dead name record and put the, um, the certified, classified, other objects, and then go ahead and run that. So any other questions on that one? Okay. Thank you, Amanda. They're keeping up on that. Um, your next one is uh, before importing, districts have two choices. Um, this one actually we just had a, an ITC question on this one today, um, and we verified with the programmers on this one. Um, if you're at a quarter end period, so your districts definitely want to make sure that you um, close both the SERS and the quarter and then import into redesign. So this is only if your district is at a quarter end and at a month end. So then you close both and import. Now, if you're in the middle, of a quarter, um, but you're but at the end of a month, then you just want to close SERS before importing, but leave the quarter open because then those quarters, those amounts on those accumulators and uh, classic will need to be imported over. Now, or if the district wants to leave um, open, so maybe you're in the middle of a period, so you're in the middle of a pay, right in the middle of a month, you have one one. Um, pay done, but you have one more pay left, then at that instance, don't close your SERS. You don't want to close it because then you'll close it and redesign once you finish that second pay. So what we're saying, if you're closing SERS and not closing the quarter and you're at a quarter end, so when you're importing what happens, um, those current and gross figures will be thrown into the incorrect quarter. So that's why it's very important to make sure that um, to uh, pay close adherent to when they're importing. What what months are they and what if they're at a quarter end? So, and if you have any other questions on that, yeah, definitely let us know on that because that can save an ITC a lot of time um, after they um, imported with trying to fix things. Um, so the next one, payroll and classic. Um, yeah, you wanna make sure your payroll is completed before you import. So all payroll, board batch files, they all need to be posted to USAS. And then go ahead and make sure um, that the uh, districts, your districts don't have any just old batch files sitting out there that have not been posted. And then if they need 
to be um, set to not post it, go ahead and rename those for them. So they don't have any just dot batch sitting out there, right, um, still sitting out there before you import. Um, the next one would be USP dat dead name report. Um, you want to make you can go ahead and run these and just check all the dead name records to verify all your addresses there um, are looking good and they don't have any like OSC records maybe for example don't have uh, any characters in them so in your dead name record um, it's under USP dat you can run the dead name record and this is uh, where you can run that for all your deductions and also under dead name then once you do that, you just want to make sure all your like um, OSCI, for ex um, example, make sure there's no, um, it's just address. That's all you want in there. You don't want, sometimes maybe they might put the, um, the name or the uh, four-digit code in there. Um, just make sure that's nowhere here in the address. So just verify that your addresses look correct. Okay. Uh, verify that the address field dead name, um, you want to make sure all the fields are in. So you want to make sure your name, your address, you want to make sure your um, city, your Ohio, or your um, state, and your zip code, um, make sure those are all filled in before importing. Okay, Andrea, we have a yes. couple questions again. Um, so first, okay. the part that you're just on with the address, um, we have yes. a question, can the second line of the name be different? I believe that should be okay, but we can verify that with the programmers to make sure. Um, I just know that we were told that just to make sure that the addresses, um, you just didn't have any of the codes in there, so like the OSCI codes. So um, they can have a second um, name address in there, but we can verify that with, um, with our programmers to make sure. Okay, thanks. And then actually we have a couple more that are going back to that board disk section. Okay. Um, so I don't know if you want to um, go back to that before we move on, but uh, the first question about that was, um, let's see, if they aren't going to be using board disk or board write in the future, do they still need to clear those accumulators? Or do they still need to do that process? Yes, they have to do this process because when those amounts are coming over, um, we want those to be cleared, those accumulators, so they so they're not imported in over to um, redesign. Um, the other question we have about that is um, just some clarification because BoardRed doesn't use the accumulators; it uses like the month to oh, date, you know how it right. calculates off of the accounts. Right. So it's so they're asking, you know, why would that need to be loaded to be zero? And then also like, you know, board just runs off a of history. So what is it that they're uploading to change to zero? I will have to ask the programmers on that one. I will I will write a note on that one since this was just a, a new one that came in. So the USP load, they're wondering what they need to change on that or to zero. Uh, well, yeah, what are we uploading to be zero? I think they want the accumulators because they never get cleared out on the 400, the four, uh, 450, and 694. So those accumulators on the 400, let me bring up my hair. Hi, Andrea. <laughs> hey, Lori. <laughs> okay. Since you were the one that just brought this on, maybe you can yeah. Yeah, leave us. We just, uh, we, this was just discovered this week. Um, we had an ITC, they had a district who um, actually migrated their data in. And what was discovered is that um, this district, they don't process board dis or board rep for their retirement or their Medicare board portion. So those amounts were just sitting on those deduction accumulators forever and ever and ever because they never cleared them out and they never ran board just to clear them. So um, what what we're suggesting, and this is for only for districts that do not process board just or board rent to get rid of those amounts off of the deduction accumulators. Um, we are suggesting either, um, if they have a district that has this instance, that they go in, set up, um, 
the object codes on the 400, 450, um, 694 records, et cetera, and then they run board disk to clear those amounts. They don't have to do anything with the file, but they're just going to clear those accumulator amounts. And then their other option would be to uh, create a spreadsheet of like their 400 and 450 and 694 records and the, the board amount, the board portion. And more than likely, they're going to have astronomical numbers in there. So just going to change all those numbers on the spreadsheet to zero and then upload that and get, it, get rid of it, basically blanking out the board um, accumulator on the deduction records. Hey, Lori, this is Sarah, and I was the one that posed this question. Board disk doesn't clear accumulators, so what would be running board disk do? Board disk doesn't clear accumulators. Because when you run board disk, it's running off history. It's not running off the accumulators. Um, That's right. I'm That's right. missing something. Okay. So it, would, it, it would be pay debt. It would be pay, pay debt. debt. Yeah. I was going to say it would be yeah. pay, what, pay debt. It's pay debt. And I'm going to have to change that in that um, documentation. I, that is my bad. I am so sorry. But yes, because a lot of times when they run pay debt, they don't run it for the 400 for, and 450 and possibly the 694. So they're never, never clearing those accumulators out. So that is totally my bad. I will get that updated. Yes, <laughs> it is pay dead. So they will have to make sure that they run pay dead to clear those amounts out of those accumulators. And um, my thinking is there's probably not a lot of districts that don't run board dis or board rest. So we never will see this problem, but it was a problem that we just ran across with the district um, from another ITC. So. There, we're, we're, we're good on that, and I will definitely get that documentation updated. That was my bad, Sarah. Thank you for pointing that out. That's Thank okay. you, Lori. Um, so if a district runs board disk but doesn't run board RET, do they still need to do something with this? Or is it really dependent on how they're running? Well, it shouldn't matter. If we're running pay dead and we're clearing the 400, 450, and 694 records out, it shouldn't make any difference. Because board this in that instance isn't going to have any bearing on it. Like you said, board this is history, so it's not going to have any bearing on that. So, um, but the problem, the problem with the whole thing is they didn't run pay debt to clear those accumulators out of the 400, 450, and 694 records for the board portion. So those amounts are sitting out there, and just get, they keep accumulating. So board just okay. doesn't have anything to do with it, and board red doesn't either. It's pay dead, and that okay. is my bad, and I will definitely get that corrected. So pay dead is the key that we need to make sure that they run that and clear out those accumulators. Because a lot of times, what will happen is they'll, like I said, they never run they never run pay dead for the 400, 450, maybe 694. And so if you if you have a district that doesn't do that every time they run every time they run pay dead and they're not clearing those accumulators, those 400s and 450s, those will show up on the deduction report every time. But if they run it and they clear it each time, then they wouldn't be showing. But right now, in any district that doesn't clear those amounts out will have to get those amounts cleared out of the, those deductions before the migration takes place. If you don't, I mean, there's not a, it's not a terrible thing, but I mean, what they're going to run into is um, when they go to outstanding payables and they run the outstanding payables report, or they try to they look at the outstanding payables, they'll see um, astronomical board mounts sitting out there. And the all like what I, what we did for this ITC is basically just have them go in and select those particular outstanding payables, which are board payables, and then just process them through and get rid of them. But I mean, the easiest way is to clean it up before you do the migration. Does that answer your question, Sarah? Yes, Hello? thank you. I was, oh. yep. I was just really confused, but I understand now. Thanks. Okay. Yep. And I apologize. That was my total bad. I, I was talking about the board this, and then I was like, "Well, you got to do that." So yeah, we're good. So before we move on, just um, we have one more clarification question in the chat, and it's so regardless of whether or not they use board district board right, should this be a step to run pay dad? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we'll update, and then the documentation will get that updated. 
Yeah, I'll, well, I'll get that updated. But the thing about it is pay debt is the key. If they didn't run pay debt, declare those amounts for the 400, 450, and the 694. Those amounts are, those board amounts are sitting out there and they, they could sit out there forever. And then that's causing an issue when you do the migration. I mean, it's not an issue, but they will see a problem on like their uh, outstanding payables reports. It'll be large amounts. And it does cause problems on the report itself because what we ran into was um, this ITC said, why did it put, it put like a, a very high gross amount, not a high gross amount, it was like the superintendent who had Medicare pickup was on the outstanding payable report for the 694 twice, once with the correct amount being withheld for the pay, but then there was another line on there with a, a basically like the pickup amount so, and it was like a large, it was like thousands of dollars. So that's what it's, this is going to basically prevent. Thank you, Heidi. I love you. Thank you, Heidi. I love you guys too, even though I made a mistake. <laughs> okay, we'll go on to the next one. Um, let's see, we were at. Okay. Um, the next one is if no pay group is associated with the counter type in classic, um, you want to want to make sure that you update or add this to on the job screen before inputting into your USPR um, or into redesign. So I want to make sure that those are done. And I believe that is is. And you can make, um, this is where they can be associated um, when they add the calendar types here. So then your pay group will know which job calendar. And then you also want to go into your job screen and just make sure that those job screens are correct. And your job screen. Hey, and Andrea. Yes. Yeah. I'm sorry, we get the most questions on that piece on the pre-data checklist, as just a suggestion, can we put maybe put little like a little description of why we're having them do that on there? Um, okay. It doesn't matter what way we do. I swear that's 90% of the time on the pre-data, that's the question we get is, I'm confused. Why do we need to do that? And a lot of them think that they have to go into the job screen and update everybody in there, even though it's associated back on the pay group. So. We always end up telling them, but if we, if we could put just a little brief description sure. of where to go, that'd be awesome. Okay. I will make note of that, and we will definitely get that updated for you. Thank you. Thank, thank, yeah, thank you. Okay. Any other questions on that part? Okay. The next one, um, in Classic, you want to make sure you run your quarter report and W-2 proc and make sure those balance, and then you want to make sure you clean up any errors before importing. Um, you can run, um, start running SRS Advance now. Um, that can actually been starting after January 1st um, to start balancing. Um, in Classic, you want to make sure um, they run BIN report. Um, if using um, USP DAT route screen in Classic, um, and you want this data to import over into redesign, you want to make sure that your employees that have 700 uh, 700 direct deposit deductions that when let me get my this is over here you want to make sure that your deductions for the 700s are filled in so this is what we're stating right here so this comes over this is if you have this in route screen this is what you would be using and this field has to be filled in in order for that description to process and come over into get to log back in. For this description to come on over. So we want to make sure those are updated before you import. 
And then the route screen would be in your USD DAT and 13. So if you use this, if you don't use that, um, then you don't need to worry. You would have to just manually add those, um, add these descriptions once it comes over. Um, otherwise, they won't. They would be blank. So this is something we had found out. So you just want to make sure that um, these the 700 records are actually filled in on the employee's dead screen for the 700. Okay. Um, Let's see, the first chance, oh, okay, also for the payroll CD and to redesign. So your first chance to import any of your payroll CD information for your districts um, is in the, in the initial extract. So um, you want to make sure that when they are doing the extract that they say true option on the classic um, USPRextract.com command procedure. And here is the detailed process for that. So when they are doing that, um, this explains what they need to say um, to um, make sure that option is true on the optional P3 perimeter. So that is their first um, time that they can go ahead and actually have their payroll CD um, extracted for all the prior, um, the prior data in years. Um, the last part of the re-import data precautions um, and reminder, if a data is being re-imported, re um, we suggest that they, any reports that maybe they have created um, already in redesign, um, to go ahead and just save those .json files. Um, and, and then once they re-import back into redesign, they can use those and then um, put those back in, um, in back into um, redesign. So they would have those, so just have them save them to their desktop. Um, if the grids have been um, customized, so if they already have some of their grids and redesign customized to while they want it and then they had a re-import, um, they would have to go ahead and um, redo those grids because it's all new information. So it's just a, a reminder um, of some of the stuff that has to be done after re-importing. Um, okay. So that is our pre-data extract procedures. And if there's any, any further questions on that one, we'll just go ahead and we'll move to post-import procedures. Andrea, I have a real quick question. Sure. Yeah. We discovered, um, mostly with our Python districts, that um, if, if in Classic they had over one for an FTE on, I think it was multiple positions, that when they migrated into production, what was happening was the compensation was, the record was not importing in, it was stripping out a lot of data on the position, and of Correct. course we weren't finding these things on the W-2 report um, because that pulls off the federal record. Is that something worth, or is it just too few of times that that's happening? Um, is that something they could run a per debt report and check? I mean, it would just, because we had to do a re-import of a, of a live district um, for 16 records that did not come in. And obviously it was more painful to have to go add all of that stuff into redesign as to just changing the FTEs in classic and doing a re-import. Is that something that's worthy of adding to the pre-data checklist? We do actually have um, a, uh, a juror issue out there for that to be corrected. Oh. And that should have been fixed on the 613, oh, we'll be on the 613. Are we on 613? No, we're on 612 <laughs> now. 12, okay, so that is to be on the 613, sorry. I wasn't sure where we're at. Um, but yes, and that juror issue is 5103. So that will be corrected once we do the release for the 613. So, but until then, um, yeah, we can put something in here to, you know, just kind of watch out for that with those FTEs. Okay, thank you kindly. I appreciate it. You're welcome. Make a note of that. Andrea, this is Susan. I yeah. have a question. Sure. <laughs> okay, so since I'm fairly new to the 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 import exports because uh, we haven't had anybody in this wave and we have a full load going into the next wave. For the pre-data um, information that you're doing here, I know I've sent our um, 
di um, districts like the cleanup as far as the dead name and those kinds of things but is everything else on there pretty much you're sending them that you want them to do or is this falling back on us to kind of look at as far as I mean like you know some of the, making sure that some of their balancing and those kinds of things is that something more or is it or is everybody anybody can answer is this what you're having you're sending it out and basically telling the districts to do this piece of it uh I, I guess that would be up to the ITC of how they want to, if, if they want to leave it completely up to the districts to verify that this information is complete, or if the ITC itself wants to go ahead and verify to make sure that, yeah, we're going to double check to make sure this is done before we import the districts. Okay. I was just checking. So I, I wasn't sure how much, how much we were yeah. checking for them or if we're relying on them to check it. I, I don't know if any of the other ITCs that are um, on this call, how do you guys do your procedures? Do you say, hey, this is what your districts have to do, or do you guys go ahead and actually do that? I guess that would be a good uh, question to ask. Is, is some other ITCs that can answer that, how you guys go ahead and... Oh, and I'll answer, Andrea, for Meta. Um, Thank you. We send that, pre we, absolutely, we send that pre-data checklist three times to them. Um, once when we tell them they're going to be in that next wave, um, when we test their data, and two weeks prior. And then some things that we as a team have done are, are the major ones. And when I say major ones, that's making sure that they've done their SERS month, making sure that they've done their SERS month. And when it comes to that quarterly stuff, making sure that not only have they closed the quarter, but also done their ODGFS file. So, we take responsibility for, we make sure, we follow up with them, we, we become fiscal stalkers at that point because the worst thing in the world to do is to have to call that district and to tell them, no, sorry, we've got to push off your, push off your migration for another two, possibly three weeks because they didn't do something like that. So we take those highlights on ourselves um, a good week before uh, their go live um, just to mostly a CYA for us, uh, just to make sure that we don't have to do that. Great. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> sure. Uh, any other questions on the pre-data? Okay. Those are all great questions. So we'll go ahead and we'll uh, go on to the next post-import procedures. Um, Again, um, this is under the migration procedures and our documentation. And a few steps after they come over, um, this is, again, um, the steps that, that make sure that needs to be done before they can start processing. Or, and the first one is the system modules. Um, we added um, the ones that make sure that they should have um, turned on. And that would be under your system in modules. And then this is where they would need to make sure that these are all installed, the ones that we have listed. So you have your EMIS contractor module, which is uh, the CJ records. Um, you want to just your email notifications, your employer distribution module, which is your board disk, your employer retirement share module, which is your board red. Um, so you need your file archive, and then also your file transfer notification service and your HTTP notification service to be turned on. Um, your leave projection module, uh, your mass change tax estimator module, and the use as integration module. So you just want to go ahead and make sure, okay, can't get it to work, that these are all turned on. And then once you did do that, you want to make sure you do the refresh button. So when I click on that, you just want to make sure you do the refresh. And now those are installed. Okay. Um, the next one is your under system is your configuration. So that one would be your account mapping configuration. This is to verify the setup matches uh, your setup in USP Con. So that's just want to make sure that what you have in USP Con 
which is right here, matches your account mapping in your configuration. So these. So just double check these are what you have over here. Okay. Um, your email verification confirmation. You want to make sure that you have that set up. You want to verify your port and your SMTP host data are accurate. Um, your email direct deposit node configuration. You want to make sure you update the form from um, email field um, to contain the correct email address. And that's also all found under here in your email. You want to verify the employee number automatic generation configuration matches what the in classic what the press I and I file is if they use that if they generate those automatically. Um, if the ITC wants to start having their own district submit their ODGS files, that is possible to do now. So they want to make sure that we have a new option under here. And right here, ODGFS. And they want to make sure they check this box and type in their transmitter title and their phone number. And then what that does then will automatically give that give their option now to the district to automatically sum, um, create that file and they can generate the submission file and they can go ahead and I think that gets uploaded to Eric if I still remember that. So that is, but if they don't have that configuration marked or on ODHS under here, this part will not show. This uh, box here, the transmitter title, all this information. So they can only run the report, the generation submission, that will not show. So that's where, how this gets turned on. But again, that's up to the ITC if, they're, if you guys are allowing your districts to do that yet. Um, another one is your core organization. You want to make sure that that box is organization is um, correct. Just verify, make sure all the information for your district um, is, and this is where you're going to find the federal, state, ODGFS numbers, and your SERS and SERS codes. So just verify that that is matching what you have over on your, on your USP con from Classic. Okay. Um, another one is you want to go to uh, payments check register and you want to make sure you want to verify that the highest check number matches what you're showing in USP con. So your USP con screen, you just want to make sure these numbers um, are matching what you have over here and under check register. So you can verify that using those two options. Um, again, and then you want to make sure that your payroll payments, the direct deposit number matches the highest number in USP con. Um, payee payments, make sure the electronic transfer number matches what is showing also in the USP con screen. Um, so you want to also run a report, which is located under reports for balance, lead balance report. So you're going to want to go ahead and click on your lead balance report. And go ahead and run those for your selected pay, pay, pay groups. And then you can run bin report and classic using the same sort options. And then you're going to um, compare those and make sure that they're the same. Um, any corrections or adjustments um, can be made going to your core leads accumulations. Um, if you need to make any adjustments, you can go ahead and um, create and find the employee, um, what position, and that would be under core and leads. And under accumulations. So the balances need to be corrected. This is where this would be done for your vacation, personal, and sick. So I'm just verify that their balances are correct. Um, another one is your ODGFS new hire report. Um, for, 
some reason they're getting um, template import records are coming over, which are orphan records. So they want to make sure they run that ODGFS new hire report um, and verify that they don't have any of those old employees still sitting out there. Um, if they do have those template reports, just run it, create the submission file. They don't need to do anything with it. This just gets rid of those old records that are sitting out there. The next one is the report employee earnings register. Um, you want to make sure that's underneath reports and run a classic earnings register and just make sure that those um, figures are matching. Um, another report to run, W-2 report and submission. So you want to run W-2 report and submission and you want to compare it to the classic W-2 proc and W-2 report for balancing. So, and then you want to, um, let's see, be advised that the importer currently does not import negative error adjustment accumulators from classic. So just a reminder for that, that the importer does not do that as of right now. Um, if the negative amount should be included in redesign, then a negative amount um, you withheld will need to be done in the adjustment. Well, so this manually would need to be entered in order to affect a payroll item. Um, under reports, the quarter report, you want to make sure you run a quarter report and redesign in the quarter report in classic and make sure those balance. Um, go to the core employee and you want to make sure you verify there are no orphan records um, by checking the grid to verify the, there are no records with a number and then maybe the last name is going to show up as template and the first name is import. And again, if these are found, just change the number to a number that would be um, for the first employee number and then you can sort by grid to find the lowest number. So just update in the employee number and just change the employee number so those um, are no longer showing in the top part of the grid. Um, the next one is the EMIS entry. You want to verify there are no employees with long-term illness days. So you can go to the more option and under long-term illness grid, underneath the grid. So you can go over here and just find the long-term illness. And let's see. And it's in there. Just search for it. Where are you? Long I think you're still on the employee grid. Oh, you're right. I am. I'm sorry. Thank you. No problem. That would be why. Okay. If we get to the right one here. There we go. Thank you. So if we go there and then you can find your long term illness date um, field. And EMS entry. Am I in the right one? There we go. Long term illness under the staff demographics. And then you have your long-term illness, and that should show up on your grid now. And there is your long-term illness. So you want to make sure that those are probably set to zero. So any balances um, greater than zero. And then you can go ahead and get those removed under the EMS employee entry. And then you can clear out those long-term illness days. Um, there's also a mass change procedure if you have many that have to need to be done. Um, we also have that field, um, a mass change procedure that can be done for that. Um, the payroll future, um, you want to verify that there are no orphan doc records that may have been imported from the doc next pay. Um, if there is any orphan records are found um, and should not be included, you can go ahead and delete these records. So you just want to make sure you go into your future and just verify that there is no records there um, right after your import. The payroll CD, um, again, this can be done anytime after the initial importing of classic data. 
again, um, I had mentioned in the pre-data that to, um, if they want to do that in the initial extract um, to follow those USP class of extracts per process procedures. Um, if they did not choose to during the extract, then they would need to follow the instructions and choose the only option from the classic extract wiki. And then this is a, a zip file. So when they go to the extract, um, two would be if they're going to do in the initiate, and if they didn't, then they would do the only. So they would need to follow those procedures on that. And then what that does will put you, um, the archive will be underneath the um, file archive on your utilities, and then that would put the information out there um, for the districts to see. Uh, if you go to the core and ACH destination, um, again, if the district uses the route screen, which we had discussed in the pre-data, um, you just want to make sure that um, all these descriptions have been filled in. So some of these might be at blank, so they just need to update um, those descriptions and make sure those are filled in. Um, just a reminder, once they start their first payroll and redesign, their new direct deposit number and redesign is going to be set to 100,000. So that does change once they run their first, uh, first payroll. It changes to starts at 100,000. Um, if the user is set up in Classic um, with the OAC and USPPT access, um, this is a role that an ITC had um, that they needed to for their employees on uh, for a district. Um, this is just stating that they will need to have this added. This is not a role that is actually brought over from Classic, so they would need to manually add this under system and under the user, and then they can pass this along to their districts or their users that actually use this. Um, is there any questions on, on anything at the moment that we have before we move on to USAC? Okay, Amanda. I think it's all yours then. Okay, awesome. We'll probably just take a minute to get switched over. Okay. I think you should have control. Yep, you have control. Awesome. Does that look big enough? I'm not sure. I was kind of zoomed in. Yeah, it looks good on my, good. my end. Okay. Yep. I know with having the video, I had to kind of switch around my uh, <laughs> how I usually have my screen set up. So. Nope, oh, looks great. Okay, all right, I'm ready to go. So um, next we're going to talk about the USAS um, migration procedures, and we're going to kind of follow a similar pattern to um, what we just saw with USPS. Um, we're going to look at the post or the pre-import procedures first, and then the post-import procedures. Um, of course, with that part, there's a little bit more complexity with the uh, carryover encumbrances and looking at those. So we'll try and look at some examples. Um, and and have and discuss that. So of course, same thing. If you have questions along the way, feel free to put them in the chat, or if you want to um, speak up, just unmute yourself and 
let me know. Okay, so um, first I'm going to go to our documentation page as well. Um, it's in the same spot in the USS, our documentation. If we go to the appendix and the migration procedures, um, we have the drop down here or you can just click right to this page um, to see all of the linked pages. So mm -hmm. first, free data extract. Um, again, there's a link to this redesign technical setup that Andrea went through in the first portion, um, a little bit more on the tech side of getting the instance set up. Um, and when you're doing these loads, uh, we definitely strongly recommend that you run the test imports uh, one or two months before dual processing, especially on the USAS side. This is really important. Um, there are some situations that we've seen where if it's discovered when they're going live, it can be kind of a tough situation because some of these things are much easier to clean up in Classic. So if you are, um, especially when it comes to older transactions, so if you are doing these test imports um, one to two months ahead of time, that gives you time to be able to clean up some of that old data so that when you're bringing your district in um, with their import to start their parallel or to go live, you're in a much better situation. Um, we're, we're going to talk about the pre-data, but especially when we get to the post-data, I'm going to try and point out the things that you definitely should be doing on a test import versus some things that you can reserve for um, just your live import. So I'll try and make sure to um, point those out as we go. Um, first, there are just some things that you can review before extracting the data from the classic system. And the first thing to look at is these outstanding batch files. Um, so if you go in and um, look in their directory, any future PO files, whether it has batch, in progress, or rejected, that is going to automatically import um, into redesign. It will use the date to put it in the corresponding posting period. So um, now we're in May, but if they have or, um, yeah, if they have um, sorry POs dated um, in a future month, so say they have them dated in June or even July, it will look at the date on that file and just automatically put them out there in that future month, um, so that they're available and ready to um, hit the system when they end up switching their month. So those are okay. Um, if there are any that they maybe don't want to bring over, maybe it's something that is an old file that they never auto posted for um, like future PO records, then that could be cleaned up. Outstanding board dispatch files, if that is something that they intend to post, that should definitely be posted before you extract the data. Um, if there are any old files that are not needed, then uh, you should clean those up. Um, you know, before extracting. And if that is something that uh, there's a board disk file that's hanging out there that doesn't get posted to USAS, then essentially uh, you kind of lose that um, information. Now it can be manually created, but that's a bit more work once you get into redesign. So definitely want to just make sure that's posted. Uh, same thing with payroll. If a payroll batch file is out there, it must be posted to Classic. That way the transaction can get into the system so that it can be included when you import. The next thing we have on here is reviewing outstanding requisitions. So um, with this step, if there's outstanding requisitions from prior years, uh, say there are some old recs out there that are not converted, um, that they never intend to actually convert, these can be deleted before extracting the data. Um, there really isn't like um, within the system like a way that you can kind of like mass delete. I think that deleting them in Classic is probably the easiest because you can kind of just go through like the rec screen um, or even in USAS web and clean them up. Um, really this step, if, if your district uses requisitions, the benefit of this, if they use requisitions in, in USAS, um, the benefit of this is that when these come into redesign, you have a nice grid now where you can easily sort and see what outstanding requisitions you have. You know, what you can sort and say any that have not been converted. So districts that have come in to redesign with old requisitions are trying to use that feature and then it's getting all muddied up by these old transactions. So I guess in a way this step, it's optional. I mean, certainly if your district doesn't use requisitions in redesign, this may not be necessary. Um, but if that is something that they intend to use, it's a lot nicer if, they, if these are cleaned up before the import.
The next one on here is to review outstanding invoices. Um, we're going to go ahead and put a highlight and a star by this one. Um, run an outstanding invoice with all dates. Any outstanding invoices are going to be imported into Redesign. These will show in the Payables page. Um, we've seen, especially lately, a lot of situations with districts that um, may use like a third party to post POs or invoices, um, or even if there was something odd that happened a long time ago, we've seen some invoices that end up showing outstanding. Um, and once those come into redesign, there isn't really a great way to clean them up. Um, so especially if they are old, uh, this is, you know, these can sometimes just be removed right out of classic before you come over, and that's really the best case scenario. Um, the key here is when you run that invoice, you're running it with all dates. Districts may use this report regularly, but a lot of times they'll run it for the fiscal year or for the date that they invoiced. Um, so that's how it's happening that they're not normally catching um, potentially like really old um, invoices. So that one is definitely worth making sure that you do before this pre-import. The next thing uh, related to invoices is also reviewing for invoices with future period dates. So um, you could look in USAS Web to see if you can locate um, these. Uh, you could go to the AP invoice page um, within there, or if you are um, after if you look at these when you're doing your test import. Um, so after you actually get the information into redesign, then you could go to um, first, the core posting periods to see if there are periods created after the current period. Um, and then also you could look at the activity ledger. Um, these tend to stand out. Uh, a lot of times we see stuff like this. It's not necessarily like one or two future posting periods. It's like somebody miskeyed the year, you know, 2060 instead of 2020, or um, they put in a December PO that was dated December 2020 instead of December 2019, like people just accidentally used the wrong year. Um, so you want to review for those and then you can update them in Classic before you do the final import. Um, that one we do have some ways to clean up and redesign as well, but certainly much better if you um, are able to catch those ahead of time so that it doesn't create you know, future posting periods that you don't really need. The last one on this section is just to review the encumbrance on the accounts. Um, basically what this is suggesting is to just run the fixed encumbrance program in Classic. Uh, this is a precautionary step to make sure that your encumbrances in Classic are properly calculated. Um, if you are in a situation where you find, say you have future PO files that you no longer need and you delete those, um, or if there have been any like manual changes, the encumbrances on the account don't always get recalculated on like your actual account screen. Um, so all this program does is it just recalculates the encumbrances to make sure it's current with the transactions in the system. This can save you a lot of headaches when you get your data into redesign if those are not actually calculated correctly and then you're, go, you know, you're trying to compare to that when you balance. Um, if the classic total isn't accurate in the first place, you're essentially chasing a ghost. So um, you know, this is just kind of a good, good step to do. It, it can't, really can't hurt anything. Um, it just makes sure that everything is up to date as far as the calculation. We have another section on here um, if you're re-importing data. So uh, say you did a test load, you're um, doing another one, or maybe you had um, you know, an instance set up for the district to train in. Um, if there are any custom reports that have been created uh, in the report manager, you would want to make sure to save the report definition. Um, if that's just in this one instance and then you do a re-import, it will overwrite everything in there and you could lose any report definitions um, that exist just in that instance. So just kind of precautionary there. And if um, the users were, you know, if your district users were in their training and they've customized certain grids, they've, you know, maybe um, added 
certain columns that they wanted or move them around. Um, when the data is re re-imported, all users would def default back to the original grid. So um, if they want to take a screenshot or make notes on what their grid setup was, that can be helpful um, to set up then when you do um, after the data is imported um, again. I do have a tip in the chat from Heidi. Thank you. So um, fix encumbrance is actually something that um, that they do right before they extract uh, to live. So um, just to make sure that if there's anything last minute that they may have done, that is calculated and current. So that's a really good tip. Um, are there any other questions on any of these pre-import steps? I guess the only thing, I, being new at this, this is Michelle from Spark, is mm -hmm. does anybody have any tips or tricks? These things get to be pretty time consuming. I, and maybe we're doing something wrong. Hey, Michelle, this is Lisa. Um, one of the things that I do when I start with the appropriations is I run both the AppSum out of Classic and out of Redesign in CSV. And then I do a V lookup between the two so I can narrow down specifically which accounts I need to look at so I'm not spending time reading through a report to find the differences. Yeah, that's what that's what we were doing, Lisa. We've been doing a lot of V lookups to map back things. We we just didn't know if there was something we were missing that would besides doing V lookups and things like that to be sure that we're getting the that, data. That definitely has cut my time in half by doing that initially. Um, I also run an outstanding purchase order report for non-invoiceable items that still have a balance, and that narrows down specifically for the most part which POs you need to narrow in on. And okay. we are actually going to look at that when we get to the post-import, so we'll look at an example of that, but that is a great tip. Great. Um, okay, so it sounds like we're ready to move on to um, to actually talk about the post-import procedures where we'll discuss the balancing and everything. So I'm just switching over to our post-import procedures page here. Um, we have added a couple of things here recently. Um, one of those being some of these PO reports that can help you locate transactions. Um, so we kind of split this up. We added a little table of contents here to make it easier for you to jump around. Um, the first thing we're going to hit is the application setup before we kind of get into that balancing step. Um, there, are a few pro uh, there are a few processes that would need to be set up and verified after USAS has been imported. Um, specifically, these first three that we're going to talk about, I would definitely still recommend doing these things, looking at these things when you're doing the test import. Um, once we get down to turning on modules and um, looking at configuration, that doesn't necessarily need to be done on all of your test imports, you know, if it's just kind of adding district info. Um, but the first thing here is reviewing the classic import log for errors. So uh, there are a couple different logs. It, it used to only have one that was kind of spit out on the tech side once the import was processed. Um, but now there is a log that can be found within the system. So uh, let's actually, we'll actually jump in and look at redesign now that we're um, at the step after we've, you know, brought our data in. So this log can be found under system. You know what, let me, I'm going to zoom in here a little bit. Uh, system monitor. And there's a tab right here for admin logs. So um, I have a anonymous data, so I don't actually have a log showing here, but I have a screenshot that I'm going to pull up. So this is what it would look like um, once you're on that admin logs tab. You'll have a line here that shows you the classic import log and then you can click to view that and it'll open up a file that looks something like this. Um, it'll show you all of the files that it imported. So these are the names of your SWOT extract files. Um, I can see that it says completed at the top. 
And then as I scroll down, I don't have the full screenshot of everything, but these little sections here would continue to go as you scroll through the log, and if there are any errors on any specific pieces, it would let you know. So there's a section for POs, there's a section for requisitions, um, invoices, etc. And if there are any errors there, um, you should review those. And then if there's any um, cleanup that you may need to do, we do have, uh, let me get back to my post import procedures. We do have a list of common import errors and warnings. Uh, so you can, that's linked right to this page. And um, so if you're seeing something specific in there, you can go to this page and um, read through. It'll let you know what the warnings mean. Um, and then some information on what may need to be done. Um, so those are really the common ones that we've seen. We do add to this page if there's something specific that um, needs to be addressed that's, that's not on there. So certainly if you're seeing something, you have a question, that would, um, you can definitely submit a ticket and we're happy to help you with those. Um, just to note like this, especially this is like one of the first steps because if you do, if there is some kind of like big error where it stops your import, you know, sometimes it can still look like your data is in there, but once you start running reports, it could run into other issues. So actually kind of with these first three, those are first on the list because it's, it's basically checking to make sure everything's good before you start because, um, you know, if you, if you skip this step, it'll, definitely cause you other problems along the way if there's something that um, wasn't completed or didn't come in properly. So the next part then is to review the application health. Um, this is actually uh, right up at the top here. We have our posting period and if we click this plus sign, it'll show, um, usually it would show uh, application health okay. So I don't know I'm not sure what I have going on here. Again, I'm in an anonymous like test instance. So um, if we look here, this screenshot is what you want to see. It'll say application health is okay. Um, if there is something that didn't uh, load properly or didn't complete when the import processed, it would say that there. Um, it'll say there was a problem during post import process. Not all jobs completed successfully. And I have a screenshot here. So that looks something like this. And um, so usually it would tell you like what it was that didn't um, post successfully. Again, this is something we can definitely help you with if you see this. Um, one thing that you can check is in, again, in that system monitor tab. Um, there are, you can see all of these jobs and, and kind of what this is doing. So like the encumbrance ledger job. So that's taking your encumbrance, encumbrances and populating them to your account page. So if that doesn't complete, then any account based reports that you run, the encumbrances may not be accurate on. Um, so we can see on this screenshot, I can see that this says it failed. Um, in that case, I'd go look at my log, I'd go right back to my log file and see if there's something um, that we can locate um, that caused that to fail. And there are a couple different things we can look at from there. Um, just to look at this in the software. So again, I'm on my system monitor. And then this second tab right here is for status. And this is where that screenshot's coming from. So this is what I would want it to look like. I would want to see completed, success, completed. Um, you may see if you if you do this right off the bat, um, some of these that you see that say completed now, that might still show it's running, um, or it'll say started. So started means um, it's not complete yet, which um, some things especially with like the activity ledger, sometimes that can just take a bit of time. Um, you know, I mean, the activity ledger, I think, can take potentially like 15, 20 minutes sometimes. So if you're hopping in right after the import, that may be something that you see. And on that note, um, that is our next one is looking at the activity ledger. Um, if you actually look at the activity ledger grid, you may see a warning that says that the data is incomplete. Um, and 
that is pretty much directly related to this. So if we were to go to the activity ledger, this one I don't have a screenshot of, um, but we'll take a look at this ledger. Right up at the top here, it's highlighted in green basically if you have it, and it just says, um, yeah, like this, the job hasn't finished posting. So um, you want to wait until that's complete. Uh, so give it some time. Um, you can keep an eye on that job status in um, the status tab, but generally at that point, it's just, you know, maybe you wait, um, you know, wait a bit and come back. Um, if you have that warning, if it's still processing and you start running reports, if you ran like a financial detail, that is created from the activity ledger. So it wouldn't be right. Um, so it's kind of an important thing to check because then it's like you don't want to waste your time going and starting to try and compare reports and figure out what's wrong if you have an incomplete report. Um, so yeah, so those three I would start off with um, once you bring your data in in your test load. Um, after that, we get down to uh, turning on the system modules. So here is a list of our recommended modules. Um, that would be under system, modules. And to turn a module on or off, you would just click the plus to add it or the minus to um, turn it off there. And let's see. Oh, I did have a note. Some modules do require um, like restarting the instance uh, after you turn them on. So those are all noted in the documentation page for modules. Uh, that's basically the ones that kind of integrate with other things, like if you have Active Directory um, or like the the LDAP directory authentication. Sorry, um, some of those ones you may need um, to restart the instance before that's able to be set up. But uh, in general, most of these you would just be able to click the plus, turn it on, refresh the page, and then you're good to go. Um, I don't think I have any specific, I'm not going to go through, you know, and, and read through all of these uh, modules, but um, we have some good notes on here if there's anything that you're trying to, to turn on specifically. Um, you know, we do have the documentation page and of course we're always happy to help. So, um, so we'll move on to the configuration because these ones I do want to look at. Um, so this, the first one we're going to talk about, so this is going to system configuration. Again, this step, especially some of these things do not have to necessarily be done when you're test loading. Um, these are kind of setup steps when you are um, actually getting the district ready to go live. Now you might want to do these when you test load so that if they are, um, you know, if you're actually training in this database, you might want to make sure some stuff is set up here. So these could be worth reviewing, um, but especially if you're doing multiple test loads, you know. Um, all right, so the first one is classic migration configuration. Uh, this, I mean, you definitely want to check this one. It's um, the adjust date and time will come over. And so that is basically determining um, when that fiscal year was closed. Um, that's used within the system as far as determining um, different transactions and things like that. So yeah, that's probably a good one to check either way, but you don't necessarily have to update this. Um, let's see. Next we have the EIS, uh, Classic Configuration Integration. Um, this one basically you're verifying the pending threshold and the settings. This you can compare to their classic um, information, uh, make sure that that threshold is the same. And let's see. Um, as far as the automatic checkbox, so that should be checked to automatically update the pending file for um, line items with the six, 600 object code, um, or if it's left unchecked, then the user would um, be prompted to, you know, check the box uh, for 500 and 600 object codes, I believe, when they're invoicing. 
The next one here is the EMIS SOAP service configuration. Uh, this one, yeah, if you're test loading and you're going to reload, you don't have to worry about entering this at that point, but um, certainly before they're going to be pulling their period H data, um, this does not come in from Classic, so you do have to enter the fiscal year here. Um, so if, you know, they need to uh, pull their financials and that's going to be for, let me use my keyboard down here. Sorry, my camera on this computer is like right above the keyboard, so it gets kind of weird if I use that one. Um, so I would just type in the fiscal year and save that. Um, and then there's the procedures, you know, once they were to submit period H for that year, then the next year they'd come update this. Um, but you do have to enter that when they get started. The next one on here is the transaction configuration. Um, so we'll take a look at this. Um, really, I want to save uh, kind of our <laughs> some talking about numbers and stuff. I, I want to save kind of our conversation for looking at the balancing steps. So I'm not going to go too far into this. There's an explanation of how this works in the wiki. If you haven't um, set up a district, if you're new to this, when you are using this configuration, it does help you to find the next available um, check number, but this does work differently than classic. Um, basically, you are defining the next highest number in the system above what the series of numbers you want it to use. Uh, so it can be confusing if it's the first time around, um, but check out the example in the configuration uh, wiki page and, um, and that setup, it's definitely something that you get used to. But again, that doesn't really necessarily need to be done if you're just doing um, a test load to balance. That's, you know, just once you're going to have users um, in the system. And, you know, you, you can basically set a series um, to be used for your check numbers, your PO numbers, or receipt numbers. All right, the next one here. So now we're on to the um, looking at some items on the core menu. Uh, the core delivery addresses, so when you import um, any address that is used on a requisition um, or a purchase order in Classic, comes over and is pulled into this grid. Um, what you can do with this grid is define which ones are going to show up in the drop down for users to uh, just automatically be able to select when they're entering those transactions. Um, because it's bringing in all of the ones that were ever used, there could be a lot of them. So they all come in as inactive. And then um, what you or this step um, you, may, you probably want to do with the district, um, you know, you'd want to mark just the addresses that you would want to make available. And so again, that's core, delivery addresses, and in my demo, I just have one, but you know, if I saw this whole list, I could basically just scroll through and check, check um, whichever ones I wanted. The next thing on there is the core organization. Um, this information comes from their USA con screen in Classic, so it's pulling over the district name, the district address. Um, these pieces are used throughout the software. You can see the district name on the top. Um, once you start looking at like 1099 or any reports that have, um, you know, maybe like the ad, or well, the reports have the district name on it, but if there's like extract files that use the district address, this information um, may be used there. So a good thing to just kind of like review when the district's coming over, uh, kind of a housekeeping piece. The other thing on this page is when you get to the bottom, central office square footage and the ITC IRN. Um, even if that information was entered in Classic, it doesn't come over. So that is something that, um, that you or the district should enter uh, when, they, when they import.
All right, the next one on this list is the spending plan. Um, so for the spending plan, um, if the district uses um, SM1, SM2 program, um, if they have SM1 estimates that are in Classic, they, those figures don't come over in the SWOT file. So um, if they want to continue using those, um, they would need to manually enter um, any of their estimates into the software. So uh, that is under periodic spending plan. And when they come in here, you would do create and you would be able to pick a fiscal year. So if they wanted to still have their estimates from last year or if it's just from this year, they could pick the year. Um, they pick a line number and then they can go through and enter their estimates, save this up. Um, it does have the create new option. So if they wanted to enter one line, save, it'll reopen a, no a new window so that they can just kind of go um, enter those all in. And then um, once those are entered, they can be used on the spending plan reports that are available within USSR. So last one we have um, on this list is the transfers advances. So uh, this is a newer, um, a newer thing that's happened is um, with the way that we uh, rearranged the repays in redesign, um, they now have the ability to see repay transactions within the advance. Um, because the transactions weren't necessarily linked in classic, um, what they'd want to do is link those legacy repay transactions to their appropriate advance so that uh, they have the ability to view those in redesign. Um, there is a walkthrough of how to link these in the appendix. So this has a direct link to what that process um, would entail to, to link those together. Um, but basically, let's see, we'd be going to transaction, transfers advances. And um, now this is a current one, but just to look. So uh, with the advance, they have this repayments section here. So for any of their um, advances that were created in Classic, this would come over as blank. And then what they would be able to do is use this little link icon to look up the corresponding uh, repay that was made in Classic and then attach it on there just so that they could view that. Um, that's kind of a one-time thing to do when they import. And then going forward, any repays would automatically, you know, any repays created in redesign are going to show in this grid because they're created from it. Um, one more thing before we get to data cleanup that I want to mention that um, I believe we're going to be updating this page with, uh, we just didn't get there yet, is um, the monthly CD. So the monthly CD from Classic can be, um, can be imported to the file archive in redesign. Um, let me go to our USSR documentation and Utilities, I believe it's under our file import. Um, so there's some information in here about um, importing. Basically, you're just pulling the um, full directory of the monthly CD um, and fiscal CD reports out from Classic. You're going to zip that file, and then you can import the entire uh, zip file into redesign. So that is available. Um, and uh, so that that's something you can do, you know, when you import them or um, for districts that are imported, that is available. Imported already, if they're already live. Okay. So I, I threw kind of a lot at you in this first section. Um, next, we're going to be jumping into talking about carryover encumbrances, reports, and balancing. Um, before we kind of move on to that, is there any questions that anyone has about um, these 
uh, application setup steps. Okay. Well, I guess the other thing, I know we're going kind of long here. Um, I'm, I mean, we're certainly going to take the time we need to go through this next section. I'm wondering if perhaps we should take a short break before we jump into this. Um, is anybody opposed to taking a 10 minute break? Amanda, could you Ed? please show me where to go that monthly CD thing again? I'm trying to find it on monthly my other CD. monitor. Sure. Um, so for this section, I went to the use SR documentation and then uh, utilities and file import. Thank you. No problem. And let's um let's see, it's like ten twenty seven. So let's come back at like we'll do like a ten between ten fifteen minute break. We'll start back up at ten forty. Okay. And we're back. So um, the next thing that we're going to talk about is your data cleanup step. We'll get to the balancing reports, uh, but the first thing is looking at these carryover encumbrances. Um, this should 100% uh, be done on your test import ahead of time. This is where we see a lot of those um, items pop up where sometimes there are things that um, do go back to uh, old transactions in Classic that can be cleaned up um, or even just adjustments that can be made on the redesign side. But if you take the time to locate them during your test import phase, this will make it go a lot smoother once you actually do the live import. Um, I also wanted to note this is first for a reason. Um, because of the impacts that um, these carryover encumbrance differences can have, uh, we're going to look at we're going to look at locating them, uh, making the adjustments, but also how it impacts the totals on the accounts. So when we look at the balancing steps later, um, there are totals on some of the accounts that are included in that, like the appropriation summary, that may be impacted by these specific carryover encumbrances. So if you locate these differences first, um, this can help later with your balancing. Um, let's see. Um, I guess I just wanted to also note that when you are on your test import step, it's kind of up to you if you want to go ahead and actually make the um, make the adjustments in your in your like test load instance. That can certainly make the balancing easier. Um, some of the differences cause um, differences, so some of the carryover encumbrance differences can cause discrepancies in. Uh, different figures. So, so for example, some of them impact your remaining encumbrance for the current year and some of them do not. So it's not just like a blanket total that you can always take into account when balancing. Um, once you start to wrap your head around these, you might be able to do that is to actually figure out, all right, here's the total difference from this and here's the total difference from that. And then you can still kind of balance, but um, you know, certainly depending on how many you have, it might be easier to even make the adjustment when you're doing the test import. Um, so that, that part of the process is kind of up to you when you're on the test. Um, but definitely uh, I've seen ITCs make spreadsheets where they track the reason for the difference and um, what kind of adjustment that they would do and they'll document that whole, um, that, that detail when they're doing the test load so that when they do the live import, they already have their list of um, adjustments that they need to go in and make. Um, also, probably on the test load and when you actually do the live import, uh, these differences, you should definitely be planning to track what the difference is, uh, the reason for the difference, um, so that 
that is part of um, kind of like your audit trail for um, what the differences are um, and have that documented and saved going forward. All right, so that's all I have for the pre-word. So let's kind of jump into what you're looking at here. Um, we'll look at this difference in carryover encumbrances page, but the very first thing that you're going to start by doing is running this classic carryover reconciliation report. And um, we'll call this the CCOR. Um, so we refer to that quite a bit um, by kind of the shortened name. So if you put in a ticket and we say CCOR, that's what we're, that's what we're looking at. Um, but from our home menu, this report can be run from here. And then we'll go ahead and generate that. So when you look at this report, um, it does have a uh, control break by the cash account. Um, so you can kind of take these, you know, by cash account or, uh, and you know, we can see the total for each um, fund special cost center. Um, it includes the full account code and the amount of the difference that's made to that account code. Uh, where this gets tricky is that this amount of difference could be from one transaction or from multiple transactions. Um, the basic idea here is that you would want to go through this report and locate the cause of each difference for that specific account. In order to help you do that, sorry, switching around a bit here, um, we do have this documentation page that shows differences in carryover encumbrances. Um, and it has a lot of information on um, a lot of the different causes of a difference that we've seen. So we've documented that and given information in each section for how to locate transactions and what the solution would be. Um, the very first thing that I usually do, I honestly pull up this page a whole lot when I am um, trying to help look at these or trying to help with these transactions um, from for like ITC tickets. So. Um, when you guys send these in and we take a look, one of the first things I'll see is, is this a positive amount or is this a negative amount? And sometimes that can help narrow down what the cause might be. Um, some of these situations happen specifically. Um, it'll show a negative amount just because of what the impact of um, what whatever happened, you know, that's what I would expect to see as a negative amount. Um, honestly, some can be positive or negative, so that's not tried and true, but I do find that to be quite helpful in narrowing down what the possible difference could be. Um, so here's where we get into kind of a, um, a tip is and a, a tip trick. Um, so over time, one of the most common situations, probably the most common situation that causes uh, these carryover encumbrances that we've seen is um, if there was a partial, uh, partial invoice dated after a full invoice. Classic would not restrict that. Um, it just had to be that the full invoice was, you know, created last, but the date that was used on the invoice, if that wasn't dated um, after any of the partials, then it's causing these discrepancies. And um, Lisa actually kind of mentioned this earlier is uh, what that ends up looking like in the system is that you'll have a PO that's not invoiceable, but it has a remaining encumbrance. And then that is what's causing the difference on this report. Um, so in order to locate these, we've created this report post import closed purchase orders with a remaining balance. And um, let me go back, sorry, I'm switching around a bit. Uh, let me go back to my post import page. So this is my post import procedures. Um, this what we're doing, what we're talking about right now is described in here. So you ran, run the classic carryover. Now we have post import closed procedures with the remaining balance. Um, this one sometimes does take a bit to generate. So I actually just generated it in advance here so that we don't have to wait. Um, zoom in here. So 
this is uh, this actually gives us purchase order transactions and um, Michelle has actually customized this report so that it actually shows in the same order that your classic carryover reconciliation report shows. So if we start looking over here, we are seeing some familiar figures. Um, I would honestly do this kind of as your first step to narrow out which one of those differences that you're seeing on the CCOR could potentially um, correspond to one of these transactions. So let me make this. I'm going to try and make this so that we can see both totals here. So in the background here, I have my classic carryover reconciliation. In the foreground, I have my post import closed POs. So I can see this first one, 9792. Okay. I can go down the list and these do match up to the amounts. Now, if I take this first one for example and I say, okay, 97.92 is what I'm off. This is what my report is showing. And look, right here, I get a PO number. So what this report will help me do then is go investigate this purchase order to be able to verify that, you know, that is indeed what I'm seeing. Um, we can check to see if it is actually like a partial um, after full. Um, and then some of these too, where it has multiple POs, uh, that can actually be really helpful on this one because we can see, you know, this 411.30, that matches up on this report, but that's made up of four different transactions. So um, this can really come in handy for that. Seeing some approval in the chat. <laughs> I'm glad you guys like this one. Okay, so let's take this first one as the example then. Um, so this 97.92. Um, so we're, what I'm going to do, actually, wait, let's, sorry, I hope I'm not hopping around too much, but I'm going back to our difference in carryover encumbrances. Um, if they're showing up on this report, there is a good good chance they're partial invoices after full. So I'm just going to go right to this transaction and um, so I'm going to look at locating the transactions. Now I already have a PO number, so I'm going to skip a couple steps here and go to my activity ledger. The activity ledger is by far the easiest place. That's, that's where you want to go to see, um, to verify that this is a partial after full. You have the ability to see the status. Um, you can add this using the more option. Um, so basically, I'm going to put my PO number in here. I have my PO, my invoices, my disbursement transactions, and I'm just going to sort this so that it shows my transactions by date. Um, so in this example, I have my PO that was dated April 30th. And then on May 3rd, for this first invoice item, I have a full invoice. However, on May 14th, I have a partial invoice also for that line item one. And I can see right here, 97.92. So that is what's causing the issue. Now, um, let's go back to my differences in carry on coverage. So, so this kind of gives me some screenshots. That's what I'm seeing here. Um, there is a note, so on the classic import log, that um, first step that we looked at under the application setup, there are warnings in here that show uh, suspicious invoices. Um, so that can be uh, referred to as well. Honestly, kind of now that we have that report, you know, I think it's easiest to look at there since you got the account number and the transaction number together. Um, but once we've determined that is indeed what we're seeing, we see that on the activity ledger, so we're confirmed that's what the problem with this one is. Um, after uh, your final import, you definitely need to do this. So um, we would have an encumbrance impact and a budget adjustment um, are things that we can do to be able to correct these figures. Um, let's talk about that. So where I'm going to go next, is the purchase order. And actually we're going to 
hope we're not going to be too much here, but we're going to look at two things at once. Uh, first, we're looking at the PO. Find my PO on the PO grid. We're going to look at this. And um, what I can see is, let me scroll down a little bit. This is not invoiceable. And then um, I can see my line item one. Um, so that was the one in question. I have 9792 as a remaining encumbrance on this PO. Me. Is this over here? Okay, so the other thing I want to look at, let me just open a second tab. I'm sorry, my Zoom meeting pop up is giving me some trouble with my tabs. So let me just re re rearrange real quick here. Okay. So on this other tab, what I'm going to go look at is the account code because what the CCR is really telling me is that the um, carryover encumber to the prior year encumbered amount on that account was increased. Um, so let me pull my account code up. We just want to view it. So um, when I look at the account here, I see my carryover encumbered 9792. So this is this is exactly what that CCOR is telling me that's happening is I'm seeing um, 9792. If I looked at this account in classic because it was increased by 9792, I can tell you that in classic it would it would show zero. Now um, what happens in redesign, well, and I mean in the systems in general, is that your initial budget plus the carryover encumbrance, and we can see our little equation here, plus or minus any adjustments equals the expendable figure. So because that carryover encumbered amount is included in the calculation for this expendable amount, um, it actually is changing that. Um, so if we want to look at let me just take a screenshot of this real quick. Because what we're going to do is we're going to make our change and I want to make sure that we can still compare. So let me just Okay. So um, if we look, let's just look, let's focus on the encumbrances right now. Um, because what we just saw in our PO is that there's a remaining encumbrance on that closed PO of 9792. So because I'm seeing a remaining encumbrance there, that means it's being included in this encumbered figure. So if we just focus on this, and that's kind of a pretty easy one to see, we have one, 1,111.92. Um, that 97 is actually being included in that while it's remaining. So let's go back to our purchase order. Um, what we want to do on this purchase order is um, correct the remaining encumbrance. So in order to do that, we would put in an encumbrance adjustment. And to do that, we would view um, the charges on our first line item. And we see that that 9792 being added, I would go ahead and create an adjustment. And, um, you know, if you uh, if you're entering these, the uh, date that you can use, I'm just going to make sure it, it has to be in an open period. So I'm not sure I opened May yet, so I'm going to put it in April. Um, but you could choose to maybe use the same date as your import. Um, and then you also have a chance to put a reference in here. So if you want to put a certain description, Um, so we'll put correction. And then what you want to do, so, oops, darn it. Hang on, let me see if that went behind it. It did. Um, what you want to do for the amount, so my total remaining encumbrance is a positive 97.92. I want to bring that to zero. So I'm going to do a negative 97.92. When I go ahead and save this up, it's going to add it here. Now my remaining encumbrance is zero. So my purchase order is correct. Um, 
my, now that my purchase order is updated, it no longer has that zero balance, it's not going to show on that report, um, on that post import purchase order report. Uh, it's not going to it's not going to show on an outstanding purchase order, order report. So that corrects my purchase order um, reports, <laughs> my transaction based reports, I should say. Uh, so let's close out of this. Leave this open for now, um, but let's look at what it did to our account. So I'm going to close out here and then I believe I can just reopen. Um, now, once we come into the account, so remember we were looking just at the encumbered figure. So I have 1014 now. So it's not 1111. It took that $97 off of my current encumbrance, off of my current encumbered amount on the account. Um, so if you um, are seeing a difference, you know, on some of the account based reports, that's, that's going to fix it there. And um, yeah, I see Heidi asked, but it does remain on this DTOR. Correct, it does. So this is adding, or this is, you know, correcting the remaining encumbrance. Um, but we can see right on this page that it's still included in that carryover encumbered amount. Um, there isn't a way to take it off of that carryover encumbered amount. Um, but what we may want to do, and this is something you probably would you know, discuss with your districts after you've located the transactions. Um, technically, you know, they didn't necessarily have to do the second part, but I would think that in most cases they want to, so that's why we have it in our documentation as a recommendation. Um, you can't change the carryover encumbered amount, but since that is impacting the expendable figure, they might want to get that back to match classic. So in order to do that, they would be able to change the other part of this equation, which is the adjustments. Um, so, we would enter a budgeting adjustment here. We can give it the same description, um, add my date there, and then I'm going to go ahead, post that, and once I come back in here, now that's changing my expendable figure. Um, so that should match classic. When you're at this point, um, you know, one thing that you could do is you can pull up the classic uh, in UCS web, you can pull up the classic account um, or, you know, in the account screen if you feel comfortable with that. Um, and you can actually compare these account figures. So uh, yeah, the carryover encumbrance isn't going to match, but you're focusing specifically on this expendable figure if that's, if that's the goal is to enter these adjustments and get that to match. Just making sure I did not miss anything here. Okay. Michelle, do you have anything to add about that part? I'm going to move on to like some other situations in the reports next. I'm not sure if you had other thoughts. Oh, I can't hear you. Uh-oh. <laughs> can you hear me now? Yep. All right. Uh, no, I don't have anything further to add, so. Cool. Does anyone have any questions on um, on what we've looked at with uh, this kind of situation or maybe with um, that report? Oh, we had some questions in the chat. Okay, let's see. Um, so Deb, uh, asked, is there a way to get the data um, that's in the new report out of Classic before the migration so that we can fix it there? I would say, um, no, I don't believe that's a possibility. This is happening specifically um, on the transactions once they come in, uh, once they come into redesign. So that's where I would say, um, you know, when you're doing your test load, you, you would run it um, when you're doing that preliminary test load, like one or two months ahead of time to get it. Um, at that point, 
let's see. Um, have we seen a CCOR where it shows no data returned? So that can be a couple reasons. Either you got really lucky and all of their data is, um, is clean, um, or that can happen. Um, we talked earlier with looking at um, the situation where one of those jobs doesn't complete and it might say that it's still starting or it didn't um, process. And so that could also indicate if you're seeing discrepancies elsewhere, but you have a blank CCOR, then maybe one of your jobs didn't finish properly. Um, uh, so for the post import POs with remaining balance, list some POs. Um, I think that might be in reference to like the previous question if it's blank. So if you are seeing, uh, I guess it kind of depends on the situation. Um, another thing I did want to mention with that post import PO report, um, and I, I hope this is related, but um, let's, let me pull that report back up. So either your job, you know, maybe didn't finish. So your CCOR report does pull from the accounts. So if that didn't complete, then it might not be showing information that it should be if, you know, the jobs didn't post. If it did post and you, you know, you're all set, your CCOR is blank, but you run this report and you see transactions, here's what I'd look at is the date. Um, if I go through this report here, and I think I do have some on here, look, I have some transactions that have a 2020 date. This isn't from a prior year. Um, that could indicate two different things. One, I could have the same kind of issue in the current year where it's a partial after full. Um, in that case, I can still fix it with an encumbrance adjustment. Um, I wouldn't need to make any budget adjustment because it didn't affect any sort of like carryover, anything that I had to do with my account figures. Um, so you could have a situation in the current year that would show up on this report. Um, the other thing that will show up on this report, and there is a note on um, that post import procedures page to watch out for this, is if the purchase order was invoiced, but it's sitting out there in payables. So they started their check run, but they didn't complete it, and then you imported their data. Um, if that is the case, it would show on this report, but that you don't have to do anything in that case. It'll um, clear up once the payables are actually posted. So let me go. get back to my post import. So here we have um, some notes on this right in um, this grid. See some more comments about, yeah, not having anything on the CCOR. So yes, hopefully that was because they did not have any differences. That would be great. Um, it, you know, one way to check, you know, if you are seeing that, um, if you know your jobs are good, I mean, yeah, when, once you um, go on to balance the remainder of your reports, then you may just be good to go. I've, I've definitely seen that before when I was at the ITC, we had a district with that and we were like, all right. <laughs> um, so yes, Heidi, we definitely celebrate those moments. Um, does set bell make a difference? So, I mean, I guess I'm not sure like what what difference. Uh, not with not with the carryover encumbrances. Um, set bell is just going to um, basically make an adjustment to bring it to zero, I believe. So, if there is still a difference in carryover encumbrances, you would still see a difference when um, you bring the information over to redesign. All right, so I'm going to keep going because um, there are some other situations that can cause these differences. Um, the next report that we have listed on here is the impact on encumbrance report. Uh, this can also be helpful in locating um, different situations that, uh, that may happen. So, 
uh, let's see. Um, you know what? Sorry, let me go here. And I'm just going to keep jumping around on you. So we'll look at this report for a second and in, in just in the fact of if I'm comparing, I'm going through and matching each one of these up to my CCOR, I might, I might have an amount on my CCOR that doesn't correspond to this report. So if that's the case, then what we want to do is come in here. Um, we can grab the account code. And um, let's get back to our home page. And we're looking for this impact on encumbrance report. Now when I run this, I have some options here where I can filter. I can enter in if I just want to look for a certain account code. Um, if you're in a situation where you have a certain PO that you're looking at, you could also um, put the PO number in here. Um, but let's do it for this account code. And here's just a little preview of what this report looks like. So it'll give you the purchase order number over here. You have your account code, um, an effective date, and then it gives you any of the transactions that are going to impact what the encumbrances were on, um, on that transaction. So uh, generally when I'm in here, there, this isn't necessarily like a straightforward tried and true um, you know, this is definitely what this is on here. Depending on the different situations, uh, this could look different. So just a couple of tricks as far as trying to locate the difference on here. The very first thing that I always try and pray works is do control F, um, F like Frank on your keyboard and try typing in your amount. So for this one, you know, it was like 411 and I'm just gonna just going to pick a number. I don't know that that was it. And um, hit enter and see if it pops up any amounts on this report. That will basically search the entire report and locate any matching transactions. Um, if you can't find the amount in there, which um, sometimes is the case, those are the hard ones. Uh, the next thing that I would do when I'm looking at this is start um, narrowing down the transactions because in order for a transaction to impact the fiscal year, it would either have had have parts of the transaction that crossed fiscal years um, or maybe if it was right at the start of the fiscal year. So basically I scroll through this report and look and say, okay, this one was August to August. It was paid and invoiced all within the same month. So that's n not going to affect, or at least very unlikely to affect my um, CCOR figures. So as you kind of scroll through, you know, I'd be looking for things that either um, had a PO date in July, uh, you know, if you see ones that are July 1, you know, those are definitely ones that you could potentially investigate. Um, or if you, you know, have starting transactions in one fiscal year and then it's closed in the following fiscal year. Um, there are multiple situations this could be, so I don't necessarily have like kind of a more detailed example in this case. Um, but when you are looking at this differences in carryover encumbrance, this does give you um, information on, you know, what to look for. Um, let's go here. Um, and, and what may be happening in that case. Um, the other thing to mention, so I hop to this invoices modified, deleted after new fiscal year opened. This is one that we've seen a bit lately. Um, the big highlight here is this audits report. So you can look on this impact on encumbrance. It will help you out with locating some transactions. Um, but if you're looking at that and you're not seeing a corresponding transaction, you don't see something that it could potentially be, um, it may be because the transaction was deleted and does not exist in redesign. So if it doesn't exist in redesign, then the redesign report is not going to help you out. Um, so instead, 
you can run an audits report in Classic. I would run this. We usually just run them wide open so you know you have all of the transactions. Um, and then you can do a find within that report. Um, try looking for the account. Try looking for the amount. Um, sometimes I'm able to find invoices you know, from the impact on encumbrance that I'm like, well, this one crossed a fiscal year, so I don't see exactly what the problem is here, but maybe if I search that PO number on the audits report, it can give us um, more information on if there was a deleted invoice. Um, and uh, yeah, so that one, not as straightforward, but definitely um, kind of just using that audits report to interpret what happened. Um, let's see. So for these ones, um, if you run into something like this, so uh, if we look at the solution here, no updates needed. We've kind of added just a little bit of, um, we've added to these solutions a little bit from what it was before just to make some notes on um, what they could do. Now, if, a, if an amount was carried over because originally like that was closed, but then the invoice was deleted and now they're paying it in this year, then the amount should have been carried over. This increase to the carryover amount is actually appropriate based on the transactions that are in redesign. Um, so this, and especially if it's, a, if it's closed, um, it, it's probably closed in classic and redesign. So this would look different. This wouldn't have a remaining encumbrance like we just saw in the last transaction. Um, so transactions in this situation, uh, don't need an encumbrance adjustment, um, and if you're balancing, this wouldn't this amount wouldn't contribute to any difference in an encumbrance total. Um, but what it can change, since it changes the carryover amount, is it can change your expendable figure. Uh, so if we go back to account, that's saying you know it's still playing a factor here, so it would still change this amount. Um, in that case then you know, perhaps if that was included in the carryover encumbrance amount, um, as it kind of should have been, then maybe the treasurer would have appropriated differently. So if that's the case, a budget adjustment can be entered to get that expendable figure to match classic. So if your district is very strong on like they want their expended figure to match, then that's a case you can add the budgeting adjustments. Um, this is certainly a step that I would be discussing with the district. Um, you know, even with adding those budget adjustments, that's something that you'll want to coordinate with them since that is, um, you know, it's adding to their appropriation figure. Um, but yes, these ones, uh, depending on the district preference, you could um, add an adjustment for those situations as well, a budget adjustment. Even if no adjustments are made, the transactions should still be located and documented during the post-import pro uh, process for audit purposes. So uh, we kind of have that in there just, just because it says no update is needed, that doesn't mean that you shouldn't still locate these. Um, and you know, and make note of of the reason, or maybe the prior transaction number. That may be something that the district needs uh, in the future, um, you know, for for audit purposes um, or reporting. Let's go. So let's see, actually before we move on, the next thing I want to talk about is um, just kind of um, like your balancing steps. So let me make sure I'm in the right spot here. Yes. Um, okay, actually we have a question, so let's see. There's a PO that had a canceled amount on the post import closed PO with remaining balance report, but it doesn't show remaining encumbrance balance in redesign. I think we'd probably have to look at that report. That report is set up so that it should only be showing transactions that have a remaining balance. So 
that might have to be one that um, we might need you to submit a ticket on so we can look at that one um, specifically. All right, so let me, uh, I'm going back here um, and I just want to quickly look at an appropriation summary. Where am I going here? Because I kind of mentioned when we started with this whole carryover encumbrance part, you know, that you want to do this first because it can have impacts on, um, on different parts of your balancing. Uh, we're going to get in a minute down to looking, you know, down to talking about kind of um, all the reports that you could look at to balance. Um, but we, we've looked at the account screen and seen the differences there. So I just kind of want to show how this would translate onto an account. Um, And you know what, I'm, we're just going to kind of look at, let's go to the totals. So when we're looking at our totals, the first column here is our fiscal to date appropriated. Then we have our prior year encumbrance and then our fiscal to date expendable. So these three columns directly correspond to figures that we're seeing um, when we were looking at that account page. So the appropriated, this is the initial balance and any adjustments prior year encumbrance, that's the carryover encumbered amount that we were seeing, and then fiscal to date expendable is expendable. Um, so when we start this process, when you first bring these in, your prior year encumbrance, that I would expect to be different by the amount that you're seeing on the CCOR. So um, that amount, you have your classic amount, and then um, depending on if your CCOR total is positive or negative, um, you're going to see that difference on this column. Now, because the expendable figure uses this to calculate, I would also expect to see the same difference on this expendable column initially, before you do any adjustments, before you do anything. If you have transactions like partials after fulls, that can also impact your encumbrance figure over here. So, um, for any of those transactions, you would see the difference. It might not be the same as the total CCOR difference because only some of those transactions actually impact the remaining encumbrance. Now, after you enter your adjustments, so we go through, you know, what we did earlier. We entered the impact on encumbrance adjustment to the PO transaction. And then we went to the account and entered the budget adjustment. So say we've gone through all of our transactions, we've entered the adjustments that we've entered. Um, what we would see in that case then, so uh, our prior year encumbrance, we can't change that. It's not changing. It's still going to be off by the amount on the CCOR. Um, but if I adjusted all of my um, accounts so that we at least got the expendable figure back, then I would expect this to match. However, because I entered adjustments to do that, my appropriated figure would be different. Um, so say I uh, had a CCOR difference of $100. So this, when I'm balancing the classic, might be off by $100. I would expect my appropriated amount, if that, that would be negative $100 because I entered an adjustment and then my expendable figure would balance. So I'm sorry I don't necessarily have a visual example of that, but I hope talking through that can kind of assist a little bit when you're looking at these reports and what you may like end up seeing. Um, because it isn't just, you know, you don't enter the adjustments and it isn't going to be just every column's exact. And that's okay, that's normal. Now at the end of the day, when I'm balancing my encumbrance figure, this should definitely end up balancing. I do want my remaining encumbrances, um, what I have open, what I can still spend on, or what the district has open they can still spend on, that should match. Um, if you do all of the adjustments that correspond to your um, carryovers and that is still different, then you may have differences within the current year um, and there may need to be some more investigation um, on the reason for that, but um, you know, normally if you've addressed um, the items, at least on that um, purchase order report, then you can get that to match.
A couple other things we've seen maybe as far as um, differences in figures on this. Um, you want to make sure that uh, you're running the reports the same for if you're including active or inactive accounts, um, or if you're including you know, all accounts or just active. Um, as far as like account status too, if the cash account is inactive, um, but that doesn't necessarily make the, uh, the appropriation expenditure accounts inactive. So just some stuff to watch out for there. Um, if you're seeing a discrepancy, maybe just run it open for you know, all active and inactive accounts and then see um, what you're looking at with the totals in that case. So just kind of a little tip there. Okay, and getting a lot of windows open here. <laughs> Let me close out of a couple of these reports. Okay. So the next thing that we're going to look at is um, this section. It, it was added more recently um, for invoiceable purchase orders. Um, so this is basically a direction on how to check for invoiceable purchase orders that have a zero dollar remaining encumbrance. In some situations recently, we've seen third party software applications have been able to update cl the classic purchase order to completely paid, but any um, invoices that were created were all partial status. Now redesign actually looks at the, at the um, status of the transactions. It'll find when that full um, transaction happened, when that full invoice was uh, dated, and then it'll uh, close the purchase order at that point. So um, if there is no full transaction, that means that redesign is going to look at the PO as open regardless of what the status was in classic. Um, an easy way to find these, you can locate these on the purchase order grid. So if we go to transaction purchase orders, and then um, using the more option, we're going to add the invoiceable and the total remaining encumbrance. And I think we already have invoice one here, so let's move this over. And I wonder if I have a note where. No, we'll find it. Here we go. So it's under amounts at the bottom, total remaining encumbrance. So we're going to go ahead, let's add that to our grid. And then we can enter our filters in here. So we want to see ones that are invoiceable. So we're going to put true, but they have a remaining balance of zero. That'll give me a list of the transactions that match this. Um, we do also have a report for this um, post import outstanding purchase orders with a zero balance. Um, and we have the report listed on here too. So it's going to show PO line items with no remaining balance that are marked as invoiceable. Now, why do you care about this? Um, I mean, technically these have a zero balance, so they're not having an impact on your remaining encumbrance. Um, but where this can cause discrepancies is on your purchase order detail. Um, if that is listed as still invoiceable, uh, it's not going to impact what's remaining, but it could change, but it would um, add to the totals for your PO total, your PO paid amount. So if you guys are running those purchase order details and trying to match up all of the different, um, every single total on there, then it will cause differences with what you're seeing between the systems. Um, and so, yeah, sometimes so you can run into this, you know, when you're balancing, but this is kind of an easy way to check ahead of time um, and address those uh, transactions. Now, as far as the solution, um, you're going to review the list of purchase orders um, that are invoiceable with no remaining encumbrance. 
I would compare these to classic. Uh, I would compare these to the classic transactions. Um, if you're in it, like in classic, if it's still open, that could happen. The district may have this PO with nothing remaining, but they, you know, pay over what the original encumbrance amount was. So if that's the case and it matches what it looks like in classic, then it's fine. You don't have to do anything for it. Um, in that case, if it's open in classic, then it would still be included on their purchase order report. So it's not going to cause a discrepancy there. Um, in that case, it's fine. Um, but if you look at the purchase order in Classic and it shows that that purchase order is completely paid, then what you can do is um, you can close the PO. Um, if the most recent partial invoice is in a posting period that's not archived, you could open that posting period and then change it from partial to full. That would close it. Um, if the most recent invoice is in an archived archived posting period, you know, it's from a prior fiscal year, then instead you can create a cancel invoice, cancel full invoice for zero dollars. Once the invoice, um, once the cancel invoice is saved, uh, sometimes we see with these zero dollar invoices that it doesn't update it to be not invoiceable right away. So if you run into that, then we have this option that the purchase order refresh. Uh, this does require admin access, so this would be done by the ITC. Um, but it's under utilities, purchase order refresh, and all you have to do is type in the PO number and refresh the state. This is really like one of the very few um, times that you would be using this. Um, other than this situation, it would only be if like, you know, we have a ticket with you and we, and we ask you to do this. So um, yeah, you basically um, type it in pretty straightforward there. Um, if you are um, attempting this, and it doesn't appear to be updating, um, but you know you created the cancel invoice, let us know. We're working on, um, there are some rare cases right now where it doesn't update right away. Um, it's basically a caching issue and sometimes you have to wait a day and do it. So uh, we are investigating a situation with that right now. So if you run into any anything odd with that, just let us know. But in general, that will be the procedure um, is to cancel, uh, enter the cancel full invoice and then have an update to, uh, to not be invoiceable anymore, that'll close it. All right. So with that, I'm going to move down to our grid here for um, your balancing reports. Now, at a minimum, we recommend the following reports to run in Classic and redesign to check totals and ensure that your amounts balance. Um, certainly, if there are other reports that um, you know you may find that are helpful to run for your districts, you know you can run additional reports to check. Um, but this is just kind of your basic list. You know, different ITCs may have different procedures, so we kind of keep this with a standard. Um, I'm not going to go through every single one, but these notes on the reports. Um, can be uh, helpful to read through if you are, you know, on your first uh, waves of districts, then um, take a look at some of these notes. But the ones that I will point out, uh, first thing is the financial detail. Um, we've added some notes onto this one. This one gets quite a bit of, uh, or gets, you know, questions here and there about uh, the remaining encumbrance. So, in your uh, classic financial detail, it's including the full outstanding remaining encumbrance. Um, your financial detail report in redesign uh, works a bit different. It actually does work on the date range that that report is run on. So if it's for the fiscal year, the remaining encumbrances are only for transactions dated in the fiscal year. Um, so when you're running these, this total may not balance and that's okay. Um, for this report, I would specifically be comparing, excuse me, the expendable and um, the receive, um, I'm sorry, the expended and the received amounts. So um, that's what's important on this report. Uh, if you were to um, look at those remaining encumbrances on here, I mean, really it's just not the report that you need to be using to verify. There are better reports to verify that figure on. Um, if you did want to, you know, confirm that figure to other reports, there are certain ways, like if you enter date ranges on the PO reports, um, but I would say that's not necessarily your focus with this one. So 
if you're just, you know, kind of comparing and those are different, that's okay. Michelle, I know that you had worked on that one a bit. Do you have anything to add with that report or we good? good? Okay. Uh, let's see. The next one I wanted to talk about is our purchase order detail report. Um, let's see. So I kind of mentioned already with this one, you know, if you do have invoiceable POs with the zero dollar balance, um, that can impact your figures. Let me go run one of these. So I'm going to run this purchase order detail just for my invoiceable um, POs and uh, we'll let this go for a minute. I'm not sure. I had actually did not generate this in advance, so I hope it doesn't take too long. Well, looks like it went pretty fast here. Okay. So when we're looking at this one, um, if I had the $0 POs, what I'm talking about this impacting, let me just get to my last page real quick here. What I'm talking about this impacting is your amount um, and your amount paid. So your remaining encumbrance might be the same, but um, those are the two totals that um, those $0 transactions would impact. Um, the other thing that you want to be aware of on this report, so the initial, um, I, I don't know, kind of just what the initial reaction is, uh, with these reports is if you're comparing to classic, you have your purchase order amount, you're looking at this column and trying to compare it. Um, but there is a note in this, um, in, in this balancing section, the PO total on the report is the original PO amount. Um, the adjusted amount in classic is taking into account any um, canceled amounts. So when you're comparing to that purchase order, uh, or that PO detail in classic, those figures may be different just because they show differently. Um, because this amount that you're seeing on your purchase order report doesn't take into account this amount canceled. If you're trying to balance those out, you want to grab your calculator and take this amount uh, minus your canceled amount and then compare from there. And um, probably the last one I'm going to highlight here is this very next one, Invalist Outstanding. Um, I kind of already talked about this in your pre, um, your pre import procedures, but I'm going to go ahead and um, hound on it a little bit again. Uh, that Invalist, if you run it outstanding, um, so you want to see any outstanding invoices regardless of date, um, and then compare that to an SSDT outstanding invoices by vendor name. Um, the redesigned version of this report is showing you what's in the payables grid. So if you run these reports and you see invoices that are really old, things that they're not intending to cut a check for right now, then that's a big red flag that there are transactions that would need to be cleaned up. Um, and I've talked about this a couple times today with you know having these transactions and payables. Uh, this is a very new situation that we've been seeing, so um, I don't necessarily have a section in this on our um, difference in carryover encumbrance um, page, although we have seen it cause differences there. Uh, we're actively working on this one to um, kind of get some kind of standard narrowed down, but it seems to vary depending on the situation. So if you are seeing transactions um, on there, let us know. This is one to put in a ticket for. We'll help you through it. And it'll help us kind of narrow down what the standard practice should be. So those are the reports I'm highlighting, but certainly, yeah, you should go through each one of these um, and compare the reports um, that are listed here and then, um, you know, go through these notes. But I know this has been kind of a long training already, so. That's why I kind of don't want to throw too much more at you. Um, let's see. Um, I have, so we have a question in the chat and certainly if anyone else has questions too, we'll, we'll address any questions before we go. So, so feel free to put them in there or, um, you know, chime in. But the first one, do you balance USPS to USAS during pre or post import? 
Um, I guess, I guess it depends on like what, you know, what you're trying to balance there. Certainly like your, you know, your payroll posting files would, um, come over. Those should, um, you know, you're posting the payroll file beforehand. So if you, you know, if you're reviewing that, I'm thinking maybe you mean to balancing like any of your, um, you know, deduction checks, any like your board disk checks that you've cut out of redesign if you're comparing those. Um, I mean, honestly, if it's pre or post import, like certainly I would make sure that they're in balance before you import. Um, I think that's probably the best plan, but um, if there are checks that you do post import, that's not a bad thing either. So, any other questions? Okay, well, I'm hearing none, but thank you all for um, signing in with us this morning. I know this was a long one, but we definitely wanted to make sure that um, we kind of touch base. You know, some of these things have been updated lately, and we know that um, something that you guys are all working on hard with um, your districts going in, you know, this wave and future waves. So, um, yeah, thanks for signing in. I hope everyone um, has a good weekend and. Um, Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.